Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So if I can ask everyone if you can come off mute for the moment and to put your cameras on. I don't mind if people are in their tie heads or their pajamas or whatever. We're all here together. And it's very participatory just so we can do our greeting. So Janelle P, how are you? And Rebecca, is it Rebecca that you say you're? Okay. Hi, Caitlin. How are you? Nice. Hi. Hi. We have Gavin and Uju who are in the background. So they'll be the two VBA people that are sitting back to assist as we go forward, right? So today's session, so um, Rebecca and Janelle, Janelle, are you still, are you with us? Oh, she's muted. Okay, Janelle, I need you to come off mute and let us know you're there and to show your face because we need to know who's participating because if not, we'll have to remove you from the session. You can just give her a couple of sec seconds. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Hi, Janelle. How are you? Uh, so she says she's at work and she can't be on camera, but she's with us. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Just as long as that's acknowledged to it. Sounds good. All right. You can go off. Okay. All right. So, uh, Rebecca, so far, um, I don't know if you made your way down to BBPA. So you have a package that is there that contains a book that we've been assigned with reading assignments. It's Meg J, and it's dealing with uh, the defining 20s. Um, which tells us strategically about different ways in which the 20s are very important to you from financial relationships, uh, self-esteem, how to motivate, how to push. And there's a lot of other um, trinkets in there for you to use. So hopefully um, sometime this week, maybe you can get a ride or you drive down just so you can pick up your package. Um, Yvette, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Fantastic. So as I was just saying to Rebecca, that you guys have a package that's at BBPA. It has a book that's called The Defining 20s by Meg J that gives a lot of really good strategies for you to be able to utilize moving forward and really assessing and analyzing uh, the importance of your 20s and how we need to look at that. Plus, there's also a booklet, a little bit of... Uh, um, I have a vision board there, a whiteboard for you to use for a vision board and would be used for some of our pieces we've been working on. Um, mm -hmm. So make sure, find your way there so that you pick up uh, your bag, okay? okay. Um, for, for today's session, so we're gonna move forward. You guys have missed the pieces of introduction where we went through um, who am I as a sense of how do you truly see yourself? Um, what is your narrative of who you are, why you believe in your goals, or what are your aims and your goals, how they've been shaped. We did an analysis of self in a sense as to how do we look at us as Black racialized women, how has society projected our sexuality, how they have, you know, framed us in a sense as what is beauty, um, what are we holding dear as our image of self? So you guys would have created that on that vision board and then we analyze certain things and we move forward. So today's presentation is dealing with microaggressions, anti-racism and, and ABR. Um, also looking at white fragility because as we know with the discussions in the world right now, we're really tackling the issues and we're addressing them. So we have different split components with regards to ABR with anti-Black racism, how it is dealing with, along with racialized communities that are also affected and impacted by it, but also the roles they play um, and also being people who either uphold the, the stereotypes and the racist behaviors or the silence that happens when individuals do not know how to engage or to call out the issues that are at play. So we're gonna talk about this. Uh, this presentation is for one that we utilize for dealing with um, officers and security, uh, more so dealing with the more white populace as the presentation is being presented to. But we're gonna delve in because there's still pieces we know, but I will shape and we will talk at any point, please feel free to interject, to ask questions, to ask for clarity as we move forward and where we come to some scenario pieces, provide the scenarios, especially when we get into the microaggressions as to how you feel 
you know, you have experienced some microaggressions or you have been in a room where it has happened, but you didn't know how to address it or, you know, you felt bad after, but yet it still went about um, transpiring or you really tackled it when it, when it happened. All right. So <clears throat> as we move forward, so our rules of engagement. Okay. I may come off. I tried this last time I came off screen and then I couldn't see any of you and I like seeing everyone, but I'm going to play for a second. I'm going to. All right, so the learning goals, right? To enhance our collective efficacy and equity and anti-racist and anti-oppressive leadership, because moving forward, we want you guys to be the ones leading in your places of work or in the institutions of study that you're still undertaking your education uh, so that you'll be able to address these issues when they come up and be able to set the proper standard and the proper framework of mentoring it to ensure that we don't have this happening in our workplace. Uh, to consider potential challenges in your workplace and to begin identifying the needs to effectively identify and disrupt systemic barriers and racism. We want to make sure that in doing this, you want to um, stay engaged. I'm going to switch this for one second. Sorry, you guys, I just have something that's just happening over here in my little. All right, sorry. All right, so remain morally, emotionally, and intellectually and socially involved in the dialogue, right? Experience discomfort because uh, discomfort is inevitable. Only through dialogue will it change, will the change begin. Speak your truth, right? Be open about your feelings. Don't just say what you think I want to hear, what others want to hear. And expect and accept non-closure. A lot of times when we're dealing with anti-racism or pressure work, otherwise known as anti-O, or when you're talking about anti-Black racism, which is ABR, uh, or anti-racism and um, oppression as a whole base, people like to um, think that there's always a Black and white answer. There isn't. A lot of times it's just we don't know. We have to write it out. We have to see because of so many colonial frameworks and institutional frameworks that are happening. Some things will never have a def definitive end or positive answer for you. All right. So we'll quickly do the land acknowledgement because of where we stand here with our Indigenous peoples. We still have to recognize we're on the lands of the Indigenous people of Canada, no matter what. We're all immigrants to this country, and we must recognize from the truth and reconciliation um, that has taken place that we must give them their due credit in what we do for where we stand, right? So I would like to acknowledge that this uh, school institution is situated upon traditional territories. The territories include the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Na uh, Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Confederacy, of the Mississaugas, of the New Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation, right? And that's one that TDSB uses, which I, who I work for, but therefore that takes in this whole great circle of GTA that we are dealing with. So I'm going to do this quick little minds on so we all understand how priming works. And now where is my video? This has got to be nuts. Uh, Gavin, Gavin, can you hear me? Uju, Gavin or Uju, can you do me a favor? Can you hyperlink this right here for me? Are you able to hyperlink on your end or no? I don't think I can on my end. Okay, hold on one second. Sorry, you guys, let me see. I'm sharing screen, so let me see something. What are you trying to do? Well, I want to, my PowerPoint for some reason, it was hyperlinked yesterday, but it's not, it's not hyperlinked. I want this video to play on Prime and how the brain works. Or if Gavin, can you just copy paste this link and then we can just play the video because we both have share. I don't know how to do that from the screen. Yeah, because you have, you alone have the um, document. I'm just the only one that has it right now. I thought we were yeah. all, okay. Yeah. There you go. What you can do is just copy the link and then open the browser and just play from there. Yeah, I'm just trying to right now see. Sorry, ladies. I was just saying to these guys, we love technology, but technology can soak us at times. All right, there we go. Can everybody see my screen fairly well? Give me a head nod. Yes, I can see your screen. Thank you. Hmm. Voila. 
Sorry, I think it's still on the PowerPoint oh, presentation. It's still on the PowerPoint. You not oh, you're that not your brain okay, actually well processes done. information in two very distinct ways. Like when you look at this photo, you instantly know she has blonde hair, is visibly angry, and likely has some choice words to yell. Without any effort, you experience okay. fast thinking. But if you look at the Ay, 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 ay. Bear with me. So how am I letting you guys see that then? Do I have to download it? Any of the techie people, do I have to download? No, you don't have to. I think what you're doing is sharing just this PowerPoint and not your entire screen. So you can either stop sharing this one and then go to sharing your screen in total and not just the PowerPoint. All right, do you guys see that now? Yeah, I can see it. You may not realize it, but your brain actually processes Thank information you. in two very Bear with me, I'm old. <laughs> like when you look at this photo, you instantly know she has blonde hair, is visibly angry, and likely has some choice words to yell. Without any effort, you experienced fast thinking. But if you look at the following problem, something different happens. Sure, you immediately know it's a multiplication problem, and you knew you could solve it if you had the energy, but didn't. If you do try, your muscles will tense, your pupils will dilate, and your heart rate will increase. Now, you've experienced slow thinking. These two systems of fast and slow thinking dictate much of our perception and reaction in life. Take these lines for example. It's clear that they're different lengths, but if you measure them, they're actually the exact same length. Even now that you know, system one or your fast thinking can't stop seeing the illusion because it acts automatically. A similar effect is seen here, which figure is the largest. Again, they're all the same size, but the suggestion of perspective and depth causes your system one to interpret the picture as three-dimensional, even though it's on a flat two-dimensional surface. It's making quick work of the available information, and so your conscious system two or slow thinking must compensate after the fact and choose not to believe your intuition or instinct. Want to see your system two in action? I'll show you a string of four digits. You read them aloud, then add one to each of the original digits. If the card reads 3795, the correct response would be 4806. We'll then go to the next card and you'll do the same, followed by the next card. Ready? Go. digits, but even harder is add three. The interesting bit is that though your pupils would have dilated, you often become effectively blind when you fully engage system two. Did you notice the color of the text change? Or how about the fact that the numbers completely changed when I put them off to the side? Listen to the following puzzle. A bat and a ball cost $1.10. The bag costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Chances are your system one intuition was yelling 10 cents, but this appealing system one answer we know is wrong. In fact, the correct answer is five cents. Even if you worked out the correct answer, you likely thought of 10 cents along the way. System one is trying to work out an answer as quickly and seamlessly as possible, which is extremely beneficial in everyday life. If every activity required full mental effort, it would be exhausting. But knowing this allows us to understand that not all of our first impressions are correct. How many animals of each kind did Moses take into the ark? So few people detect what is wrong with this question that it's been dubbed the Moses illusion. In fact, Moses took no animals, Noah did. Again, our brain invests as little resources as necessary so that things run quickly and smoothly. Because Moses is not abnormal in the biblical context, System 1 unconsciously detects an association between Moses and Ark and quickly accepts the question. In a similar way, System 1 generates context without you knowing. Reading each of the following may seem fairly simple. A, B, C, Anne approached the bank, and 12, 13, 14. But your brain actually interpreted these ambiguous statements without you ever knowing. You could have read it as A, 13, C or 12 B 14 but your brain created the context unconsciously also you likely imagined a woman with money on her mind walking towards a building with tellers but if the sentence before this was they were floating gently down the river the entire scene would have changed because bank is no longer associated with money without an explicit context system one quickly generates one based on previous experience in this case you've likely visited more banks than rivers and so the context is resolved accordingly this ties into a concept called priming. For example, if I said wash, how would you complete this word fragment? Most would see soap, but had I just shown you the word E, you'd be more likely to see soup. 
In this way, both eat and wash prime your thoughts. Though System 2 likes to think that it's in charge and knows what's going on, the truth is that priming effects have even been shown to affect and modify behavior. These arise in System 1, and you have no conscious access to them. If you'd like to learn more about the thinking systems in your brain, check out the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, which covers... Okay, so... The reason why when we talk about the priming component and when they note it to you that it is your subconscious that is, that is actively acting, because when we think from the time we were a child, from the interactions that we engage with, the things that we are taught, our experiences that we do, it's all leading into that subconscious framing that we deal with. So in society, the things that we have heard about individuals or women or men or various cultures, various races, ethnicities, identities, it's already locked in from what we have already previously learned or experienced and it's sitting in our subconscious. So as we move through and talk about racism, anti-racism, oppression, we have to re-challenge and reframe some of our thinking because we already have a set norm, either from our early formative learnings from when we were a little child, even right into our educational frameworks, from the different reading that we have undertaken to the different sociologists, we have to now start to do the null culture and be able to break it down and look at the key pieces. Um, so as we move forward, think about how priming has already impacted the way you have led your life from now right into your 20s that you lead in the aspects of how we think. But based on our learning from either our home life, that if we have individuals who have told you to have a counter narrative to what is the dominant norm of white culture, white society, who has always inflicted certain type of um, stereotypes of what individuals are, whether you're Southeast Asian, whether you're Black, whether you're Chinese, there's always some form of a norm and that has been put forward. And we will discuss and talk as we break those down. So key equity terms for right now that everyone should know. This is otherwise known as what? Somebody tell me, what do we know equity, diversity, and inclusion? Give me the three words that it's, that it's called when we're talking about anti-racism work. Anyone, just voice it. Nobody? So this is either when you hear the term EDI being thrown out. So that is what you'll see now that we're on this whole... Um, conversation when we're dealing with anti-racism work. Everyone is talking about, they're looking for people who have experienced an EDI. So that is equity, diversion, and inclusion. When we look at equity, we're looking at a condition of state of fair, uh, a state of uh, fair, inclusive, and respectful treatment of all people. Uh, equity does not mean treating people the same without, without regard for other individual differences. Diversity, the presence of the wide range of human qualities and attributes within a group organization or society. The dimensions of diversity include, but are not limited to ancestry, culture, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, language, physical and intellectual ability, race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, and social economic status. When we talk about inclusion, it is based on the principles of, of acceptance and inclusion of all individuals. It sees themselves in their curriculum, policies, their physical surroundings, and the broader environment in which diversity is honored in all individuals, where all individuals are respected. All right, so that you have a base understanding of EDI. All of you take a quick screenshot of this if you haven't, but I'm going to at the end of our whole program, I'm going to do a little resource package where you have proper anti-racism terms that you should look at or know so that in moving forward, um, we, we go and we understand this. But this is when you hear people talk about EDI, it is equity, diversity, and inclusion that they're speaking of. As we move forward into the anti-racism and oppression work, that's where we deal with the anti-O, the ABR, the white fragility, the white privilege, and that's where you're really delving further into anti-racist work. All right, so when we look at this slide, so you guys all come off mute because I'm gonna ask you to, 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 to actively participate. And this is not one in which um, we're talking about um, you know, this isn't about who's right, who's wrong. This is a learning curve for everybody. Tasia, good morning to you. We're looking at anti-racism and oppression work. You've missed a little bit of the slides, but just try to jump in and get to where we're at now. So when we look at this slide, and when we're talking about equity, and we just talked about EDI inclusion, we know when we look to the far left, People like to make the thing as, oh, everything needs to be equal in society, right? And, and we need to have the reality of what we look at. Well, if you look at the reality, 
nothing is, is properly equal or balanced, right? We know that there's one group predominantly, it'll be the white group that normally sits in this scale that has far more elevation, far more privilege, will be able to see the ball game far better from an elevated stance and, and, and platform. Then we have those who might be in the middle class category who are able to at least get a little box up and able to look over the fence so they at least get to see the lay of what is transpiring in the game. And then there we are, the people that are more impoverished or more in the black racialized groups are always having a barrier to being able to actively engage and participate, still trying to figure out how can I see, what can I do, I'm at such a disadvantage. When we talk about equality, people like to say, well, we'll just make the world equal. Well, all right, you want to be equal? Everybody gets the same box. However, is that equal? Just as you look at the image, is it equal? Come on, guys. Come on. Talk. I like to hear voices. I can't we're in the classroom. Be you. I'm sure I feel no, it's not. Equal, right? it's not. It's not. Because it doesn't matter, we all have something that's affecting us. Whether if we look at this, this little guy is a, is a shorter person. So no matter what in life, his advantage, her advantage will always be where they can't see what everyone else is going to be able to see, right? The person that's tallest is always going to have a higher perspective and be able to look over, be able to get there. So it can never say that equal or equality works for everyone. It doesn't. So when we talk about, when we go to equity, what is equity saying that we need to do? So if you look at this picture to give you the, the, the notion, what is equity now? It's like the idea that certain people, in order to be on like a level playing field, certain people need more assistance or more. Exactly. Exactly. So let's see, I'm going to jump off of this to change it around. Okay, so right now we're sitting in COVID. And the government has created the CERB, right? So, or CREB, some people have been using it that way, right? So CERB or CREB, whichever way they want to pronounce it, right? So everyone's now receiving their 2,000 whatever dollars. Is that e equity or is that something that's called equality? Definitely equality. Okay, it's, 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 it's actually, it's very much equality because people think, oh, the government's given everybody 2000 and something. So we're now all, everyone should be able to make it. Everyone can pay their bills. Everyone shouldn't be, you know, so, so hindered or, or hurt in this world right now with what we're happening, but it's not true. Especially when you think about just geographically, the GTA compared to the rest of Ontario has the higher amounts for, for ink in the sense of um, housing, how much you got to pay for housing. To live in Toronto, and whether it's Mississauga, Oak, Oakville, Brampton, Markham, Scarborough, Pickering, right? You're still looking at a one-bedroom apartment is running you $2,000, if not more, right? So they have to sit there and start to readjust and reassess because if I'm in Windsor compared to Toronto, that $2,000 plus is going to stretch a lot further. And then depending on where I live, the family size I have, who I'm taking care of, the $2,000 is no longer about having equality, right? Because the disadvantages still exist within our system. So we have to look at it. So when we talk about social justice, social justice is saying, get rid of all the barriers. Forget about trying to say you're going to try to level up the playing field. You have to ensure that all pieces are looked at appropriately so that I can actively engage. So when we think about our priority neighborhoods, we think about GTA. So if you're thinking about the Jane and Finch, the Malverns, the, the well, it used to be Regent Park, and now they have to reassess this whole Regent Park with what they did, um, you know, the Flemington, et cetera, et cetera. They have to add more based on where the people are living, what the, um, you know, the, the income is on the level field for everyone. If you're only making minimum wage, the $2,000 is not going to help you then pay your cell phone bill. It's not going to help to pay hydro if you're paying hydro and utilities. It's not going to help if you have any type of uh, car payment or if you have any type of, um, you know, your gas or your TTC pass, uh, then groceries. So there's a whole lot of things that we have to look at when we're having those conversations. Yes, um, um, who raised hand? Mejo? I'm sorry if I'm not saying Yvette. Yes, it's Yvette. Okay. Yvette, um, can talk. This is what I want to do because sometimes I can't see the thing, so just come off mic and talk. Go ahead. Perfect. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could go back to slide six. I want to make sure that I took that screenshot. I wasn't able to earlier. Okay, no problem. See, that's what I like, that interaction. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. I got it. Mm-hmm. So Tajay, take a screenshot of this. 
as we were talking about, this is known as when you hear of EDI, this is equity, diversity, inclusion, which a lot of workplace now, the ones in particular, we're talking about corporations who have bought on and signed on about the um, um, making sure that they have a certain percentages of representation of black and racialized people now in their corporate structures in the higher level. A lot of them are posting jobs for EDI. So just so that you guys are aware that when you hear the term EDI, it's about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I want you to have a clear understanding of the definitions and what they mean. Uh, so that some of you can think about applying for some of the jobs if you know you have the knowledge, the base, and the skill sets to be able to move an institution further. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So when we go now to slide eight, so the principles of equity and anti-oppressions, right? Intent versus impact. What do you guys think? What does that mean? Intent versus impact. Anyone here a, crim, um, a criminology or a sociology um, grad or undergrad person right now? No. Okay. Take a while, guess. It, impact versus uh, intent. I'm thinking when I read that, that it's what we wanted to do versus what we actually achieved um, as a result for the people who are targeted by the uh, Very good. So the project. Very, very good. Now, if we look at it from an OHRC perspective, what is the OHRC? And you all should know this name because it was massive in the news just the other day. They put out a major report on Toronto Police Services. So who is the OHRC? The Ontario Human Rights Commission. Very good. I'm loving this group. You guys are on it. All right. So the Ontario Human Rights Commission, again, another term you need to write down so you clearly know. I'm going to show throw out abbreviations because these are things you want to naturally just have as in your repertoire that you understand these terms. And when people are speaking or they get thrown out, you're like, I got this. I know what's, what's, what's being spoken about. All right. So with the Ontario Human Rights Commission, it is not your intent. Right? So when you want to lay a lawsuit against people and they say to you at work about, oh, it wasn't my intent. I didn't mean to hurt you when I said that. It was a joke. Or you took offense to it? Why? It's everyday speech. And you're just going to be like, no, I did. I did take offense. It did hurt my feelings. I feel that you created injury or you belittled me in front of my employees or in front of my colleagues. I feel ostracized or I feel whatever it might have been the scenario is very very clear your intent is not is not is not what's 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 what is the main framework of your defense it is the impact if you make a statement if you do something untoward if you create harm injury to the psyche the physical framework of individuals that's where the heft and the weight of the problem is for you so we all got to be very mindful now especially in this society you hear a lot of people are very fragile very sensitive to certain things so you want to make sure you think before you say or act in certain frameworks because there are people either on the good or the bad of it, the impact component will be what they want to jump to, right? So intent versus impact, know that. So sometimes you may want to jump into cuts off two people because they bothered you or, you know, if someone is doing something that's just on your nerves and so you just want to shut it down, you have to shut it down in a proper way, right? So be mindful of some of the terms you may use and how whatever the facial expressions and things that get uh, put forward, we want to be mindful. All right, so when we're talking about anti-racism and oppression, when we're having things, there's no such thing as neutral. A lot of us like to sit in silence or something has happened, people like to go, oh, um, I don't, no, I don't have an opinion. Oh, I don't know who had, who went wrong, no, no. We have to start, we need to start to move in an action framework. We can't keep sitting in the framework of neutrality because that's why things continue to happen around us. That's why racism continues to happen. That's why bigotry continues to happen. That's why we start to see the ostracism that's going on because there are people witnessing and watching, but yet sit neutral. They don't say anything or they say, oh, I don't, I didn't see what happened. Right? Because we're used to the norm and even our cultures and our societies, we've been taught as a kid, see and what? Walk away? No. Come on. <laughs> it's enough time to tell you, see, I'm the blind, right? So more or less, it's a Jamaican thing by notes and all the other West Indian cultures that might be termed differently. But they're like, you see what happened. But when somebody asks you, no, Sam, that's not, no, I didn't see. Mm -mm, mm -mm, no. 
I was busy, I, I turned my head or whatever the case scenario. No one is certain framework. So when we're talking about an institutional racism, when we're talking about systemic racism, those things we can speak up about. I'm not saying to you walk out in the middle of where you see crime might be happening in your in your environment and you're just being big and bold say, I see you, I see you, right? We're not trying to set you up in a placement of danger. Not that. When we're talking about institutional and systemic racism, that's where you want to make sure that you're not neutral in a place nor silent, right? Choice is the hallmark of privilege, right? So when you can pick something, you know, today I want an apple rather than an orange, you have choice. That's a privilege. There's a lot of places where people don't have a choice of either one of those, right? You just have to eat or take what is there in front of you. Um, majority and minority is not about numbers, right? Oppression is not bound by time and space. Uh, systems and structures drive practice. Anti-oppression is an action, right? You must disrupt the status quo. The voices and experience of those who may be marginalized will be brought to the center of discussions and decisions. And this is what we have to push where we are in our workplaces, our institutions of learning. We have to ensure that our voices are heard, that what's being taught always has a reflective piece that includes us. And if you have professors that are continually, you know, in philosophy, talking about, you know, um, the Plato's and, and the Hobbes and the Aquinas's, which are all great. I love all those theorists. Make sure you're bringing in, though, um, aspects of Baldwin, right? Bring in some of the studies of, of Langston Hughes. Get to get to some of our Black literary people and what they have written and bring in their philosophies. Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey. Have them have to, to show the comparative analysis. Sometimes you may have to do it. But it's very easy. We're all in college or university. We understand how to do comparative analysis and be able to bring learning into the classroom. Because when we continue to be devoid and left out of learning, they continue to perpetuate these myths and these norms and stylings to say that we don't exist. And the same with Gandhi and everything else of various other Indian um, philosophers and individuals who are missing, right? We do have a bit of Confucianism. We got Mao Zedong with some of his pieces. So we hear about Genghis Khan and some of his um, aspects but we have to ensure that when we're, we're there in our learning environments, we are able to also toss out some of our greats who also have nuggets that have been stolen from other people and they've never been given their credit. So we want to ensure we put in. Anyone have any insight here or anything you want to say with regards to this slide and pieces? I do have a question. It relates to what we've been talking about, like equity, uh, social justice, and et cetera. There's been a lot of conversation about hiring more diversity, hiring more Black people in workplace. And I'm just wondering, how did you um, qualify that initiative as, like equity, um, social justice, or like what type of category would that fit in? So with what they're doing now, it would be what's called equity work, right? So that's the EDI component. So when you have corporations, so the whole RBC, the whole banking industry right now has just put out for a slew of hiring for EDI consultant or an EDI um, training officer or an EDI, what's the other one? They've, they've termed it. Um, um, it's almost even like a human rights officer, but they've given it a different title. So a lot of people are trying to bring in someone that is a black or, or a Southeast Asian type of uh, uh, face to their organization to, to deal and tackle the issues. We haven't gotten in really into anti-racism work yet because until the policies that they use uh, clearly are focused on tackling anti-black racism, dealing with indigeneity, talking about white privilege, white fragility, then you haven't landed yourself into the realm of anti-racist work. It's still equity work because we're now in 2020, but those corporations are just now looking to ensure that they have reflective diverse faces. Got me? Does that clarify you that? Yes, thank you. Okay, and that's where I just want you guys to know in a sense, right? There's a difference between EDI. EDI is the entry components. That's the, the newer, um, you know, simplified language of dialogue, of getting to talk about diversity. Um, when you have people like the Kika Ojo, Tana Turner, the Carl James, and, and the people, um, the Akua Benjamins, those are individuals who have moved straight into now anti-racist work. So now they're really dismantling the structures of colonial frameworks and the EDI and really going deep to say that policies, procedures must tackle, address these issues that are at play. And when you talk about the microaggressions, all right? Anybody have anything? 
and then I will, you know, sit there and 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 scrap some of the the, the slides we're dealing so that we get to our pieces. So when we talked about choice, right, a little while ago about how choice um, is a privilege, we're just going to do this real quick. So everybody has the race race. No, it doesn't matter. It won't it won't help me. Um, everybody have a piece of paper at all where you're at? Do you have a piece of paper? Pen and paper? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think the only person at work will, won't have it, but okay. Do you prefer to eat carrots or broccoli? So put a C or B on your page. Visit the dentist or the doctor? Actually, no, let me do this way. We'll just vocalize. Go back from the very beginning. Everybody come off mute except for our young lady that's at work. Now unless you can, you can quickly uh, voice from where you are at work. So everybody come off mute. And you're just going to say, and even my BBPA people, I want to hear your, 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 your perspective here. So, all right. Eat carrots or broccoli? Just say your opinion. Broccoli. <laughs> okay. So most I hear is broccoli. Okay. Broccoli. This is the dentist or doctor? Doctor. Dentist. Doctor. Dentist. All right. So doctor is a predominant one. Okay. Uh, like an urban setting over a rural setting? Urban. Urban. Okay. Um, listen to the Beatles or Drake? The Beatles. The Beatles. Yeah, the Beatles. Really? I'm not even the Drake. No. <laughs> have, have five children or no children? Uh, no. Five, five children. children. Five. Five. Okay, five was majority. Okay, interesting. Go to Chicago or Florida? Florida. 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 Okay, so I hear Florida is more. Okay. Do you like the daytime or the nighttime? Nighttime. Nighttime. Okay, I think that was about even. All right. Um, are, do you like the summer or the fall? Summer. Fall. Summer. I'm missing some. I think summer was the majority there. Okay. Chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? Vanilla. Vanilla, vanilla ice cream. Okay, so that was the vanilla. Oh, oops, someone's trying to get in. What did I do? Okay. All right. Um, do you like Malcolm X or Martin Luther King? Malcolm. Malcolm. Malcolm X. All right. Majority of people at Malcolm. Shakespeare or Langston Hughes? Shakespeare. 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 Yes. Okay. Um, Carabana Parade or Pride Parade? Carabana. Carabana. Okay. Uh, complete quiet. Um, so in this case, I'm going to switch it around. Uh, completely quiet friends or friends who challenge? French Friends who challenge. Friends who challenge. Okay. And last, um, would you send your child to public school or private school? Public school. Private. One more time on that one. Public. Public school. Okay. Private school. All right. So majority of people said said public school. All right. What was missing with these questions? For some of you, why you had you may have hesitated in the way in which you you asked. What's missing the way the questions are framed? There's no box for alternative slash other because I don't really like everything like that. Okay, so, <laughs> so they didn't give you an alternative, so you were locked into what you had to get. What else? There's no context or setting, like right, rather... right. No context or setting for so so for some people. When I asked the question, Shakespeare or Langston Hughes, some of you couldn't go to Langston Hughes because you have never studied Langston Hughes. You yeah. don't know who Langston Hughes is, right? Mm -hmm. So it creates a difference. What I was surprised with, with our demographics, because what I said, this presentation is normally geared to um, white colleagues, counterparts in policemen justice. Beatles was their natural default because that is the group in that they most will know over Drake. Whereas our group, the majority of people picked the Beatles. And at your age group in the 20s, you guys picked the Beatles? So either Jake is doing something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> right? And the question was me, right? And I, I'd like to know from people, why didn't you pick Drake? What's Drake doing wrong? Uh, I don't know. I'm not from Toronto, so I don't want to offend okay. anyone. No, you can't offend nobody. Remember we said it. This conversation here, it's about speak your truth. So nobody can get upset. So... What, what do you think is doing why, why Drake is not appealing to you? Um, personally, I think he's doing great, but like, I don't like that he is, I would say he's a culture vulture and he's just doing it in a way that 
like if he's doing it so openly and no one is critiquing him and to me that's a free pass and it shouldn't be like that it's it's rather unappealing so like i don't know where people are going with like being blind just for entertainment or i just i don't know i'm just in my own space about that okay someone mm-hmm. else Anyone else? I just don't like his music, per se. <laughs> <laughs> all good, all fair. I also got something too. Um, usually when um, Drake is like performing his things, he likes to be a bit more obnoxious than other rappers or musicians. Usually when he's um, like, I don't know the way that he acts he just acts like more than others like if he forgot where he came from or whatever yeah he reps toronto but re- realistically yeah he's just putting on a front for everybody but like he just acts like he's like that top guy and he needs to like relax for a little bit you know those ones <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, some people say he's not or he's going beyond right but the issue yeah, for me, though, is though that's going to our first class which we i'm too bad so many of you guys missed but What's wrong with this confidence? Don't we say that everybody needs to be confident, that you need to just, you know, be be there, stand proud in it, or has he just gone too far? He's just too far. Like, he needs to tone it down a bit. You know those ones? <laughs> okay, all right. That's <laughs> good. But the main thing for here to take from this is when we have certain things thrown out as this, we got to try to figure out and always ask, though, what is the context of certain things? Well, how is this being framed? Um, and, and how can I answer um, appropriately if I don't have the background or in some of the categories, right? And we know that in society, a lot of times you're put in situations where you have to pick one way or the other, and they don't provide you any options, and they don't even give you the context of things, but you always got to be ready and prepared to say, do that critical analysis, and where you can't ask for clarity later on, ask for clarity, because it might very well just be that someone could say, well, I don't eat carrots nor broccoli, so I don't want to answer it. Right. And then people would be like, oh, so you're not being a team player. You're not being willing to participate. It's not a matter of no, it's a matter of fact. You didn't ask me, right? You didn't ask me, do I have an aversion to carrots or broccoli? Maybe I have an allergy to both of those things, but you didn't ask me, but you make an assumption. And a lot Mm -hmm. of times in our workplace, they will say to you, oh, well, we're going for drinks. But nobody ever asked you, are you a person that drink? Right? right. Don't ask you if whether or not you like to be in a bar setting. So there are a lot of these assumptions that happen, and people just feel they have to do the norming and go along to get along. But there's certain times where you have to also put things in the right context. If you cannot impact your, because there are people who are religious, there are people who maybe have, you know, again, we're talking about people in their 20s. We all know in the 20s, you, you everybody does the bar crawl, or everyone goes probably may have had a bad night of drinking. So you no longer want to be in that experience again because it didn't work out great for you. So that's not your thing. Don't be afraid to to clarify to people. And when they try to make you feel bad and go, oh, you're not being a team player, just be, I'm sorry. I'm very much a team player. I'm very collaborative. However, what you believe as your social excursion is not something that is my social excursion. But I'll gladly meet you in the park to read a book or I'll meet you at the library or we can sit and have a, a social dinner somewhere else. Right. So don't be afraid to, to put your values in the right context. and You don't have to follow people. Anybody? You have anything else? We good? I'm just wondering, yes. Like when does conversation comes? Because I think as someone who's working, I have situations where people expect also you to justify. And I think that's something that came to mind when we're talking about your values and saying, drawing the limit. I'm just wondering how much of an explanation do you think is necessary to say no to something? Just your one statement is all you require. Because remember, once they start to approach upon your, your rights, um, and that's when you will just have to state that, right? So I'm sorry. I think I was clear in stating that I'm just not an individual that drinks. That should suffice mm-hmm. on its own. If you're going to continue to, to harass me, then you use those terms. If you're going to continue to harass me, to know what my moral or religious uh, component is, you're in breach of the Ontario human rights, right? Then they'll know to really back off and then they're all gonna walk away cursing your backside and saying that, oh my gosh, she thinks she's all this, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, no, I gave you an answer. You are the one that decided you want to continue to push, okay? Mm-hmm. 
but just yes. stand firm and then that's where we're trying to level you guys up in the sense of the language and understanding the stances that you you take to just shut things down in that no i don't have to give you my life story because the other piece they love to do when you just come in when you go to that staff room so where are you from and what have you been doing they want to know your whole life and it's like me and you know friend we're not friends like what are you doing i don't need to give you that i'm from here toronto just as you where are you from turn the script on them right Turn it around. Where are you from? Oh, how many degrees do you have? Right? Because a lot of times they'll ask you, oh, where did you go to school? How did you get to school? We, we had this discussion previously in one of the sessions, but you got to know that wherever you're not comfortable to divulge your information, because again, your work environment, majority of those people are not your friends. You may take one or two people from work into your real friendship category, but a lot of times it's just the superficial friendships that are developed. Right. So you don't want to divulge a whole lot of your life. Not unless you're a person that's just an open book and you're like everything to be out there. But I would say to you guys, going into a work environment, keep your personal life separate from work because there are people who will act as if they're your friend, but they're not your friends. And every bit of information you give them, they use as a tool within your work environment to try to bring you down. Right. Because it's still a competitive environment and people are all trying to escalate and get to the higher echelon and you don't know who might have a jealousy for you. So don't give people too much information. And even if your best friend, who is your natural best friend, works in your environment, you make sure you tell that best friend, don't share my business. Right. You want to make that clear. My work life, personal life are separate. Anybody else? Right. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. There's a word that you've used a couple of times. Was it et echelons? Yeah. Okay. So upper echelon? Yeah. Sorry, do you mind? What does that mean? Right. So when you talk about the upper echelon, so the higher heights that you get to. So when you think about a mountain, when you climb, uh, the upper echelon is where the air is thinner, right? And rarer up at the top. And the same thing. It's where you, when you ascend to a higher level. Right, so in an organization or a institution, the upper echelon would be the supervisory role. From the supervisor, then you're getting into um, like an executive director position. And then of course, the highest of all would be the director of the company or the CEO of the company. So those are when you say the upper echelons, those are the people with the higher titles as you climb. Thank you. No problem. All right, so preference versus bias, right? So what is the difference between this? What's the difference between a preference and a bias? Basically, um, a preference is something that you prefer rather than someone being um, like, just talking out of their ass like nonchalant and and talking about the sky being red when we all know that the sky is blue um i don't know they just need more information on the bias part but um preference is like something that you prefer and bias is like something that isn't tr like basically true you know all right somebody else Anybody else? Uju, do you have something you're saying? Yeah, I was going to say that it almost looks the same to me until you like have a deeper, like look deeply into it. So I would say preference is, you know, preferring something over the other, but still giving room for other options. Um, and, and But bias is just like putting your foot down for something that you think you believe in and not just not being flexible and just um, speaking to your you got to speak into your mic for some reason you're muffled can you hear me yes now you're clear okay so i was saying that for me preference is you know preferring something but also giving the room for other options being flexible but then for bias um i see it as not giving room for anything else just putting your foot down for something you think you believe in something you think is right but not giving room to not being flexible and not having that diversity of thought. Okay, no diversity of thought, being not being flexible, putting your foot down, being more rigid. Okay, anybody else? 
Yeah, I I agree with what's been said. A preference is maybe something you like, like you like people who go to the same school as you because you had a good experience there, but it becomes biased if you become somebody like a super, uh, if you are hiring people you only hire from the school you went to, that would become more of a bias. Okay, anybody else? Okay, good, good so far. Very good. So yes, a preference is something that you you like, right? It's like, eh, I don't care. If you want to go to the beach, I'll go to the beach. That's my preference over going skiing, right? However, a bias is more to the point where you're more, in an innate sense, you're more rigid in the sense of your flexibility. So you're like, no, I don't like Chinese food, right? So when people are saying, well, why don't you like Chinese food? No, I'm gonna like it because here they eat, right? They eat cat or they eat dog. You've now rendered some type of a negativity to something based on something you know, or it could be from an experience, but now you're more rigid in the sense of your bias is landed in that framework of, of, of not selecting something. Um, whereas people can just be, even we talk about the dating world, there are people who just naturally say, no, I'll never date a black person. Well, why wouldn't you date a black person? Well, they're crooks or they're always poor or I, I don't want to have to deal with, with what they have to deal with, right? And vice versa, I won't date a white person. Well, why won't you date the white person? Well, because they don't bathe properly or they, you know, they have racism. All these different types of things are stated. But yet people have to, you want to have to challenge and delve because it's like, okay, so what's that bias based on? When did this get created? And it goes back to that video and we're talking about the whole priming. What created, what statement, what points are creating your biases? Um, people will just say, okay, and I will challenge when people go, okay, as an educator, I'll go, what type of a learner are you? Because you guys should all know about multiple intelligence, right? So am I, you're either a visual learner, auditor, auditory learner, you're either a tactile learner, you might be uh, a kinesthetic learner, right? There's different type of learning styles. Now that's a little bit different because it's based on how, when you were as a baby, what was, was, was uh, provided to you with regards to the learning styles. Some parents give their children vibrant color um, you know, toys to play with. Uh, some parents did the auditory books or the reading books, or the children grabbed that more. Other children played more to develop and build. So that develops your skill set. So it's not really a bias, that's just your skill set preference. But biases come into play by what people continually tell you or your experiences that you have seen. You start to lend and lean towards a certain way to create your biases. Um, if someone said to you, What's your favorite color? Is that a preference or is it a bias? Someone tell me. A preference. So why Yvette, did it become a preference and not a bias? Because how did you land with just one favorite color? Mm, I don't know how to explain it. I just feel like they, you choose something within a bunch of other options. I don't see how it could be negative or I, I don't see the negative connotation. So it made me feel like it was a preference. But there is a bias because it took you a while to eliminate all the other plethora of colors there for you to now say, well, I have, this is my color. And people know they have a color because either one yellow looks great on my skin tone and it makes me just feel great and more vibrant and alive. Other people will say, well, I love black as black is strong and it slims down my figure or the illusion of making me look slimmer. So color is also a bias because for most people, they have one color that they'll be like, yeah, that's the color that, that I have predominantly in my wardrobe because I like it. You like it for a particular reason behind just the fact that it looks good, right? Mm -hmm. There's a little bit more behind why you have a favorite color. Because remember, when you look in a crayon box, there is a plethora of colors. There is a slew of colors. Even yellow has a range of, of what yellow is. Sorry, I have garbage uh, getting collected here. Hold on, my apologies. Sorry about that. All right, Yvette, do you want a challenge or, or, or what do you think? I'm simmering the information. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else on that? Yeah, I have a question. Um, with preference and bias, are they mutually exclusive? Because I'm seeing like an overlap or does it depend on the context of the situation? Like it can start off as a preference then turn into like a bias. Like with color, can there be that 
preference without the bias existent and vice versa? Well, it depends because it can be mutually exclusive and at times there is a gradient that, that drives you from preference to bias, right? Because as I said, the experience and what is the, the nature behind why it becomes your go-to, right, is, is key. So um, if we stick with the color. So yes, as a, as a child, think about your, your SK, not that so many of you can go back to SK, but let's go to uh, grade nine art class. Right, and they give you the crayons because you have to make a watercolor, whatever the case is. No, watercolor wouldn't be correct because you there's, you have to use a lot of colors. Um, what's that one thing you do? Um, that geographical shape one that they always make you do in grade nine, where it's a um, it's all the different shapes, and then you just add what colors you want to make it either vibrant. For most parts, people will pick, and they tell you pick four colors. Right, so people normally go to their favorite colors to do that activity to create it, right? Because it's just a natural norm to go to what you like, what speaks to you. So that would be where, okay, it's a preference. Those are the colors that, that make this look good. But if each time when people say, well, what's your color and you keep picking green, then you have a bias to the other colors because there's something about green while you keep going to it. Do you get me? Yeah. Right. So that's where it goes from just the preference. Preference are simple things like, okay, uh, you want to go to the beach or you want to go skiing? Right. And if it's just in that context, where are we going for our vacation? Right. Are we doing the beach or are we going skiing? Okay. My preference is going to be the beach. Now, if someone says to you, though, but this is like the fifth time and we've asked you what to do, whether camping or whatever, you keep picking the beach, you now have to stop and think, well, why is the beach the, the default factor that I always go to? Why haven't I picked camping? Why haven't I picked the, the, the golfing or whatever? Or I haven't picked skiing? Why is that? Do you guys get me? Yeah. I like what Yvette said. Simmer. Let it simmer and meditate on that one and we'll try to. Go ahead, Yvette. I see you came off mute. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just I, I was researching on the internet at the same time and I just found something like a the definition that I could also suggest, I would just put it in the group chat. Mm -hmm. Maybe this can help too. I found it interesting when they said bias is also like impartial judgment, maybe because there's more to know, you didn't consider everything. Anyways, I just pasted it for everyone to see. I thought it was interesting how they worded it. Okay, so 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 and then you get it a little bit more, right? Yeah, exactly. So I wasn't off, correct? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. I like that. All right. So our next slide. Okay. Um, this one here. So I'll let you take a few minutes and you guys think about it, right? So deep within our subconscious, all of us have vices that we consciously harbor. Harbor means we hold dear, right? And the world, the worst part is we act on them. Okay. And that's by Carpenter. So do you agree or disagree with this statement? And then you have to be able to tell us why or why not. Okay. Is everyone biased? Okay. Let me know. And then how might our biases play out in the workplace? Or in this case, it might be your school or your institution where you're at. So think of those three on the sense of bias. And as Yvette just said, she gave you some information in the chat for you to look at. Um, or you guys can do your own Google search where you're at. So I'll give you guys like about... Mm, five minutes to, to, to write down, jot down, think about your own answers for this, okay?
Hi guys, anybody there? Yeah, we're all here. Oh, I'm just checking. I thought it froze. I'm sorry. No, they're they're getting some time to work on this little mini assignment right now. We have two minutes left. Okay, everybody. <clears throat> All right, share time. So who's ready to start off? So do you agree or disagree with this statement? Why or why not? Um, I can start. So I definitely agree with the statement that everyone has bias. Um, I think we like to think that we act like independently and we like make choices based on all kinds of things, but it's really, I think a lot of it has to do with like just the bias that we hold. Um, and I think everyone is biased. Um, and I think the way that that can work out in the workplace, for, like one of my friends and I were talking about just the idea of like hiring. So people like, like to hire people who think like them and look like them and sound like them. So you're like biased towards people who are similar to you. So, or like, I guess you prefer people who are similar to you. Um, so I think that's one way it can play out. Okay, good. And I think Caitlin mentioned that for you to see when we're talking about the biases too, right? Next. Yeah, I would just like to add on. So definitely there may be bias in the hiring practices but, um, and it may take, I think it should be more merit-based, like who has actually may have like the experience or who's like willing to learn on the job. And that may take more time in the hiring practices. Um, and then I just mentioned in the chat, like once you're in the workplace, it's easier to overcome bias. If you're actually, if you're doing the work, then you, you can uh, vouch for the work you've done um, if it, whether it's based on numbers or um, clients you're bringing in or some other example. Okay, next. Um, yeah, uh, I believe that we, I agree with this statement and I agree with this statement based on examining bias through like um, a social cognitive perspective. When we think about kids, like you were saying earlier on, um, even with their observation turning from preference to bias, we learn through observation and what's around us. And like through that, we become what we see. And through conditioning, we internalize things through our subconscious minds. And because we also have that fight or flight function within us, we tend to favor things that protect us. And then that's how bias can form as well too from a young age. So considering the fact that we're drenched in so many different things without realizing it and how we're taught through our parents and we don't have access to all of how the world operates. That is why I believe we are prone to being biased because we favor things that we know and what's familiar. And then with regards to the workplace, similar to the hiring practices, but also how we interact with others. 
For example, um, I also work at McDonald's. So when I have different customers come, depending on how I've interacted with people within my family setting, I might, ha I might already have an idea of how someone's going to act or behave or how I'm going to operate based on what I have experienced. Okay, next, Janelle. If Janelle can, I'm not sure if we're... Um, Lika, is it Lika? Yeah, um, honestly, this the wording of the content is uh, a bit hard for me. So like, it's taken me a while to actually understand what it means. So I haven't really like taken time to um, come up with an answer because I don't know how to put it. No, I, I believe that um, everybody, like, honestly, bias is in us. So it comes with everybody. And, um, yeah. You're, you're <laughs> right on it. Don't, don't yeah. worry about it. You are answering it. That you just made it famous. We do all have biases, and everyone has, has rendered it appropriately, either from the family settings from which we come from, the lack of other experiential learning outside, whatever yeah. the potential framework is. We all naturally have biases within us. Now, the yeah. biases are, are then get scaffolded differently, but we do have biases. And I think um, Rebecca and Caitlin had had a dress sanitation in the sense of in the workplace, it, it naturally plays out from the hiring practices that they develop. Now, Caitlin has gone more into the aspects of meritocracy in the sense of work ethic once you get in the workplace to hopefully overcome the biases that employers may have. Uh, but this issue still comes to how do you even get through the front door of an employment um, agent you know, or, or corporation. That's first and foremost. And once you're in there, the work that you have to do to prove yourself even more so than your white counterpart is very even hard and um, issues, but we'll delve further. So very good, you guys. So that, that part worked out. So we're all on the, the same page there. Um, the next group in that we have to have a clear understanding and you guys can take a snapshot of this. So um, the terms are dominant group, the group connected to the particular social identity category that has the most power within society. So we know that in this case scenario, it is white dominant culture and society where the power uh, lies at any of our institutions or businesses. When we're talking about the upper echelon again as to who hire, who leads, we have that. Now, you may have aspects where there might be one or two representation of other people of color. In most case scenarios, it'll be someone who's either Southeast Asian or someone who is Chinese, or it might be the one or two Black individuals that hold either a COO uh, type, so as a chief uh, operating um, officer type of a role, or they might be the CFO, a chief financial officer, but rarely do you see a Black individual as the CEO, right? So, we, we, we see that we will have some representation, but it's not across the board. So therefore they are not the dominant group when it's when the sense of power. Uh, the next thing that we need to clearly understand is barrier. So barrier, um, the thing that stand in the way of success, uh, some can be self-imposed and others are, system, are systemic, right? So for some of us, our own barriers are, we may not uh, make sure that we were able to complete our college or our university degrees. Um, in this world and what is happening, we have to ensure that if we do not have the educational background that helps us to compete, we better have the experiential learning that, that makes us that much better in, in either technology, in our articulation, the way in which we volunteer in places. So that way we can develop our resume from the different volunteerism that we have, right? So there are other ways to circumvent educational, uh, you know, degrees and BAs and MBAs and PhDs to put down in masters, but it's a way in which you have to make sure you do a lot of volunteerism to be able to develop that. The other term that's important is, uh, is oppression, right? The experience of repeated widespread systemic injustices that systematically disadvantage Pacific populations. And as we know, Black, Indigenous, and then different racialized groups, either coming into then Southeast um, um, Asian, going into our different Filipino populations, then breaking down into our lot of our, our other, um, other categories of people with regards to migration rates, right? Um, and then the other term is privilege, right? So a set of unearned benefits, right? That are given to people who fit into a specific social group. So again, privilege is predominantly 
to white, um, white Canadians is what's known as the privileged group, but depending on the setting and what we're dealing with, we also have Chinese um, groups that, that also have their privilege with the enclaves that they've established in the various communities, right? So um, we'll develop a little further. Anyone else need any more time to do a screenshot of this or can we move on? I have a bit of a, not a funny question, but maybe, maybe, maybe unconventional. Do you think there's such a thing as a black privilege? And if yes, what does that look like? So black privilege is such as when you think about some of our African nations. So if we take Ghana, if we take uh, Nigeria, um, if we take closer to our commerce is high at the moment. Um, at one point, Uganda was also, I would say, where you have privilege, because those were three African nations where leadership and everything that has happened is all pro, is all black. Their, their mantra, their policies and procedures are all pro-black. Uh, at one point, they were, you know, even right now, when you look at Uganda, the whole aspect of white colonial framers coming in for businesses and even the Asian structures, they are now fighting against that to say, no, you can only invest or be able to appropriate X amount of land. And if you're here in the country, you must ensure you hire our people first and foremost in positions of power, et cetera, et cetera, right? So when you think about that, or if you look at um, Jamaica per se, Jamaica has privilege of black privilege in a certain sense that all leadership, power, justices, et cetera, are all reflective of the black people there. However, we all know that colonial frameworks and structures still exist in Jamaica. When you think about who, you know, Asian influence coming in as far as who is doing all the construction, who is able to manipulate and buy land. So um, there is power, but when we talk about power, power is about the economical framework of power, along with then the, the striational aspect of power in the sense as to who creates policies, legislations, procedures. That's power, right? Because when you think about society, society is about we are all governed by laws. So if you can't write the laws, you're not the person changing the laws, you don't have power, right? If you're not the person able to enforce laws, you don't have power. If you're not the individuals that have the, the institutions of lending for money or the borrowing structure for, for borrowing money, you don't have power. Those are the three areas of power. Does that clarify you, that? Yeah. Right? but we have power in a different way. So when you think about the push that's all happening right now and the whole thing about support black businesses and um, ensure that you try to keep commerce within your communities, it would be if you look at, yes, the largest um, earned spending power is the black community. Even though we do not sit in positions of the largest um, earning power, our collective spending power, what we spend on, be it from the designer clothes, the cars, the, you know, the homes, the, the simple running shoes, whatever the case is, we spend more than any other ethnicity, right? Even though we don't earn the same power, but we spend more. But we have to learn to leverage it so it stays within our community so we can try to build up because we don't have our own banks. Uh, the, the Asian community has their own banks. Uh, European communities has their own banks. The Indian community now has to establish their own banking system that, that they borrow from, right? So we're the only group that still does not have our own bank, predominantly in Canada. The U U.S. now has their own bank that, that now they have started to really rev and send their money into and you see a lot of the stars putting their money there and the athletes putting their money there so that uh, bank loans and mortgages and loans for institutions can all be given to um, you know black students and people but we in Canada have not established it yet the JCA and them are trying to do it but we don't have so we don't have the the um, power to move our money appropriately uh, in our systems for housing for for commerce etc all right. So everybody has that screen. I'm just going to assume yes, because I can't see your lovely faces. Everybody has come off. All right. So this part here now, so when we move into the workplace or into our institutions, right, when it's not personal and it's not about insult, when people talk about you are privileged, right? So this is now dealing with your white counterpart and what's going to transpire, right? So Having privilege says nothing about whether or not you have a difficult life. Because a lot of times they, they will throw out with you, what are you talking about that? I have privilege. I had to work hard. My mother didn't pay for my university. I had to work two jobs too, just like you had to work two jobs. So I don't have privilege. 
And that's when you have to look at them and say, I'm not talking about that privilege. You don't have to worry about walking through a door in a bank and people staring at you. You don't have to walk and worry about walking downtown Toronto and any police car stopping you, right? So privilege is in the framework of your skin color and the society and what we have set out. So um, you can have privilege in one aspect of your life while having struggled or encountered disadvantages in other ways. It may not, oh, sorry, I may not know the struggles of someone with a physical disability, but I have struggled as a transgender person. Checking your privilege isn't about conceding that you had an easy life. It's about acknowledging that there are certain struggles that you will never encounter that are very specific to certain groups of people. And that's what you want to make sure that in having the dialogue when we talk about privilege, and this is for white privilege, is the fact that their skin color does not hold them back as in ours does, whether we are Black, whether we're, we're Southeast Asian, we're Indian, Chinese, whichever way in which we want to identify ourselves, we still have aspects that our skin color is still affected or impact us in certain ways, certain institutions, certain um, environmental normacies that we have to deal with, right? So um, we still have to deal with, the, you know, if a Black woman goes into a work environment with a big Afro, is she going to get the job? Is her black counterpart that goes in with a wig that is that is loose and flowing as in replicated as either white hair, would that be more the framework to which they would want to look to to say that, hmm, that more or less fits our our our, our, um, our normal policy rather than the black power girl of Angela Davis that's walking through a door because she might be problematic because my prime says Afro black, black power, that means she's gonna be radical and gonna to wanna to challenge our positioning. All these things come into play because people, again, prime in notion thinking. Same thing with names. Um, Rebecca? Yes. Your, your ethnicity is, is, is a Southeast Asian? Or are you a Guyanese? Uh, no, my family's from Jamaica. Oh, you're Jamaican? What are you mixed with? Sorry. Dutch. You're Dutch. Okay. So, oh, who's white? My mom. Okay. So, will people say to you, that you have privilege. Those who know you, knowing that you know you have a, a black and a white parent, anybody say to you, oh, but you have privilege? Uh, no one that I know personally okay. has told me that I have privilege for that reason, but I, I, like, I know colorism exists and I know that there's all of those like issues. Okay, right? Because looking at you from this screen here, I, I thought you were Southeast Asian, right? So apologize, but the way I, That's okay. I'm looking, right? So it, it lends in the sense that people will again classify you, right? And we can't run away from that because it comes to the part where we're talking about the biases and the priming and how certain look, people just naturally, we look to try to classify to what we know, just from what we see, from what we know. So White people don't have to worry about that. They're not walking into the room and people are going, oh, are you Dutch? Are you, are you Portuguese? Are you, you know, Italian? Are you whatever? It's just, you just, they just walk into the room. Whereas we walk in, and in this case it would be Rebecca, even Caitlin, I can't see the other people per se, but people notice that, hmm, there's, there's a mix there. Something is, something is there, right? So now it's that delving in type of thing about, okay, hmm, what is it? Right, what category do they fit in? Um, could I, right? And there will be employers will be like, hmm, for Rebecca, she might tick off two categories for me. And yeah, Caitlin would be two categories too, kind of, because they're mixed. So I, I kind of would, it works, all right. They, they, they would work for us. And we got to think about that, that those are some of the key things that when you guys are walking into places of employment and where you're working employment, be conscious of it. It's not that you have to raise it, but it's about we want to be conscious that certain things are at play, right? Because at some point, for I'll just say Caitlin and Rebecca, because I can see um, you guys more so, as everybody from, think about from the time you've been either in your educational institutions or places at work, how many times have you been asked, oh, are you, are you mixed or mm, yeah. what are you, right? Because some people don't have the words, so they do the, what are you, right? Well, like when people ask what's my background now, I kind of try to change it to like what's my educational background or like what's my work experience versus like what's my race. Good, good, okay. But you know exactly what they're asking you. Yeah, people always like to ask like, where are you from? And I'm like, Canada. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? Or you tell them my mother. That used to be my, my mother, right? Yeah. So just to, just yeah. to keep throwing them off until they really, have, it forces them to say, 
okay, I want to know like what, what mother and father, somebody is, right? And then that way you get to and say, well, why is that important? But I have no problem to tell you, yes, I am Dutch and Jamaican or whatever the case is. But you just want to put them on notice that I know what you're asking. And I'm going to call you out on it. Right. And to the whole point where Caitlin's saying, well, I'll just say, oh, you mean my educational background? Right. Just to throw them off so they have an understanding that you're approaching something you shouldn't be approaching. Or I'm very much aware of the fact that you're trying to get to what my ethnicity or my race is and really shouldn't have a, any type of a bearing. But once we get to be friends, if you want to have a dialogue like that, sure. Or you can say to them, oh, are we going to talk about race and identity now? Do you want to have that conversation? And are we going to make sure we talk about the whole, whole setting of our, our institution? Right? You just do it with a smile so they understand that, yeah, so if we want to have this conversation about race and identity, let's make sure we're really having a real conversation, right? So we want to get into that. So so that we're clear. Anybody else? Sorry. Any I do have um, a common question slash. So I think from my understanding, the problem with the question, where are you from? or Where are you really from? What's your background? Is that it's so intrusive? Because I believe that in other contexts, I'm always curious when I see people who look like me or age like me. I just have this curiosity that I want to know where they're from. But what I have a hard time with is like when I have to justify or when I have to just talk with other people who don't understand that it's inappropriate. Like right now I understand the work example, how it's intrusive, but how, for, how do you push it back? I, I heard uh, one of the uh, participants say she talks about her education. I'm just wondering what kind of sentence I can say. I'm very like, I like to use keywords. I was wondering if you had an example. Caitlin, do you want to repeat what you had said when they asked you about, oh, what's your background? What, how did you frame it again? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if it, it also depends on who's asking you, uh, how long you know the person, but definitely just you can say what school you are currently attending or where you no, graduated you, from. You use the word in that you said. You, you said to the person, are you talking about my educational background? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So you got, it's a matter of just flipping it back like, Oh, my background? You mean my educational background? Mm -hmm. Just so that they're clear. And then when they go, oh no, no, I mean like, right? Because then they'll they'll get to the real point. No, I mean like what are your parents like? Or what's your then they might find the real words. What's your ethnicity, right? Or what's your nationality? And a lot of people, this is another piece I want you guys to know. A lot of people keep saying what's your nationality compared to what's your citizenship, right? And this be my place. When people say your nationality, Nationality means your place of birth, okay. right? So a lot of us, because they make an assumption that a lot of people are immigrants, right? But if you guys are in your 20s, you're not immigrants for the most part, if you get most part, you're, you're for the majority, you are citizens, you like you are nationality of Canada, you're born here. So we want to be mindful of that. So when they want to bring up about, well, what's your nationality mean? Oh, you mean my place of birth? I'm Canadian. That's if you're Canadian, right? So I'm Canadian. Mm -hmm. Right. And then some some might trigger. So people like me who know words will then go, oh, OK, what's your citizen? So your citizenship, you have no citizenship. You were born here. OK, I get it. I get it. So, OK, what's your what's your ethnicity? What is your makeup? Like, what's your parents or what are you or where do you come from? Right. Like, what's your parents? What's your what's your lineage? Right. So when people get into what's your lineage, what's your parents heritage? Now they're trying to really get into, OK, are you Nigerian? Are you Ghanaian? Are you, you know, from Rwanda? Are you Jamaican? Are you uh, Bahamian or whatever the case is? And they start to doubt. But you've got to remember in the workplace and a lot of the school institutions, people don't have the right words to be able to contextualize and ask you the question. But it comes back to what Caitlin had also addressed. How well do you know the people? So if you're feeling uncomfortable for someone in a workplace that doesn't know you, that's going, oh, well, what are you or what's your ethnicity? You can just, just stop and ask and go, why are you inquiring? Mm -hmm. Right? Because if you don't feel, if you feel that there, there's something just a ways about it, just turn back and say, well, why are you inquiring? How does it age you? And if they just go, oh, I'm just curious, that's mm -hmm. different. That's where you can just be, oh, okay, well, I'm from wherever. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just a matter of just gauge why and how, but turn back so you have a clear understanding and they understand that. I know what you're asking me and why you're asking me. So I'm just, we're going to put it on the table. I'm going to smile with you. I'm going to ask you, so um, why are you curious? What for? Right? Not that you're hiding. You just want to really make that individual understand that this might not be an appropriate question for you to be asking me, and I want you to know that. And if you can give me a good answer, I'll answer you. If I don't feel like it was a good answer, maybe I'll just walk away and go, hey, keep on guessing. When you can guess the right one, I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. trust me, if it's a person that's really curious and they just want to know, they'll sit there and keep coming. Oh, are you Nigerian? Are you Jamaican? 
Are you right? They'll keep coming with the foolishness. And then you're going to get to a point where they've now already landed themselves in hot water. You're going to be, uh, your harassment is highly inappropriate. Right? And then they'll reel off and realize that, okay, this is wrong. But if it's just someone who's trying to get you, because a lot of times too, in work environment, people just, they're curious about you. They want to know. Remember, if you come in, a lot of places, if it's predominantly of, of other races of people that are not you or reflective, they're intrigued because they have their own biases and negativity. So they're not used to bright, you know, black racialized women walking in that might be masters or might have an MBA or have had several degrees behind them or have had great volunteer work experience or are super articulate. Because you'll get that when you get into microaggressions where they say, you're so articulate. Oh my God. And that's a lot of times I turn back and I say, oh, did you not go to school? Right? <laughs> they get vexed because it, it hits them and they realize, oh, that was dumb of me. And it's like, yeah, because the people hired in this environment should all be articulate because they're supposed to be university grads or they're supposed to be people who have some form of, uh, you know, institutional higher learning. So it's interesting. Or did you think I was a pygmy? I've done that before to people. I said, oh, did you think I was going to I'm a pygmy? Was I supposed to chuck a spear and run around in, 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 in lion cloth or something? And they're like, oh my God, no, that's not what I thought. I'm like, well, then think of your stupid question. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that because sometimes you've got to put people back into their place, but do it with the proper word in that because the question then becomes, why would I not be intelligent? That in itself is an insultive statement. That in itself is a massive microaggression because why would you ask me, the black person, when I speak and say, oh, you sound so intelligent. Well, damn it, I spent how many thousands of dollars to get my university degree, so I, I would hope I'm intelligent, right? I would hope I can articulate the words and have an expansive vocabulary. Now, when they sit there and I say, oh no, it's because, oh my God, you just have a better vocabulary than me. You're able to you know, put your words together. Then you can go, oh, okay. Thank you. You know, I my, my master or my Western degree or whatever. I, I, I'm just happy to be able to be, you know, involved in different experiences and settings. So it's given me more of a better worldview and a better dialogue to be able to explain things. Then you can grasp that. But you need to put people back on their place very quickly when they come with, oh, you're so articulate and you're so well put together. Well put together. Oh, you mean because my pants aren't slung behind my backside or my dress isn't just clung to me like a video vixen that you thought we would be? And even if my, my clothes is clung to me like a video vixen, I'm going to let you know that I'm still very bright. And don't look at this body or exterior to think that it is a stereotype of something else, right? So there's a lot that we as Black and racialized women are having to go through. And as we had in the previous classes that unfortunately you guys missed in, in person is the fact that we talked about the, the aspect of the stereotypical view of beauty and the sexualization that happened with us because we have figures, right? We have figures that can't be hidden. Our buttocks, our hips, our small waists, our, you know, our voluptuousness, we can't hide that. And a lot of times it's always from an image that they see from media, from video, from whatever. So they have an assumption that if someone looks a certain way, they're this. If they dress this other way, they're that, right? Or they already have it assumed that, oh, the black people, you know, especially I've had it before too. I roll up into work and I have my reggae blasting like crazy and you step out and then people are like, oh, I thought you were like, you know, this. And I'm like, hmm. Well, I'm Jamaican. It's going to be my music of choice. But do you want to talk about Phil Collins? Do you want me to talk about ACDC? Do we want to talk about Tom Collins? You know, because I can do that because that's also the other norm of music that I've raised up in because I am an 80s baby. So let's go there. Right, so you just got to know how to turn things. Look, oh, talk to you guys. I've been rambling. Uh, Yvette, I was yeah. wondering what you were saying how do you assert your power accordingly because with that example you gave you said if they respond saying oh well I was just saying in comparison to how I speak how do you because you don't want to of course there microaggressions exist but then there there is also jumping to conclusions as well too and like you said you have to be careful but you still want to assert yourself so how do you then do that because someone could generally be saying that and then it's identified as a microaggression and vice versa because what happens if I respond in that manner? No, actually I am this. 
And they're like, I wasn't even talking about that. I was saying in regards to how you just articulate yourself in comparison to how I've learned to articulate myself. And that's where you, you just do back like what I said, though, because if you go, what do you mean, right? And they'd be like, oh, no, I was just, and they say, well, you know what, to the point. Well, you know, I guess my, my, my experience at wherever you come, wherever it is, University of Western, McGill, wherever it might be, I don't know, maybe my experiences and, and the, the group, um, my degree and the people I socialize with just exposed me to more of a learning environment or, or an aspect to be able to better, um, you know, communicate or be effective. And don't be afraid to say that. Right. And if the person wants to take offense, that's for them to take offense. But you're just clearly stated because they're the one that said, oh, you're so articulate. And when you say, well, what do you mean by that? Right. And if they say, oh, well, you can put your sentences better together, whatever, just, you know, it, it could be just my experiences being involved in, you know, the debate club or I've been on task force or whatever. Find a way to frame it. But you're clearly letting the person know that you're just not a regular joke. Right. You've had experiences where you've allowed yourself to make sure you can be shaped in different ways to be able to communicate effectively. And those are the terms you want to use. And they talk about, oh, you're so articulate. Oh, you mean I communicate effectively? I'm able to, to, to you know, speak on various levels and I don't have Ebonics, right? Use the words back. And if the person goes, no, I didn't mean that. That's not what I was saying. Then just go, okay, then clarify. And if they say, no, I just mean that you can put your words together better. Say, oh, no problem. You know, I've been involved in this or participate in that. And therefore you've done your justification, but you've moved on. You're not sitting and writing in that. If they want to sit and be, you know, feeling bad about it, that's on them. That's not on you. Because as they're wanting to develop a relationship with you, they will better explain and be able to express themselves. And if it was just a genuine that they're in awe of you, because we do have people that when they speak, you're like, oh my God, they can really just put sense together. They know how to just grab things. How did that person just know how to grab that research um, information like that? Because remember, different people have expertise in different fields. So depending on what they're talking on, they're going to be able to deliver something better than others. And that's okay. But then the next person will be better in a different category. So we all have our strengths. We all have our weaknesses. And there's nothing wrong with being able to say that. So the person was genuine. I just, I think you're fantastic. Then you're just like, after they explain themselves, you can be, thank you. Thank you. Right? Right. Thank you. That clears it up. No problem. All right. I'm seeing time is just going on. So I'm going to to what I really wanted to get to. Um, all right. So the aspect of white privilege, I deal with proves that some people benefit from unearned and largely unacknowledged advantages, even when those advantages are, are, um, aren't discriminatory. Um, it has a pretty long history in the 1930s where W.E. Du Bois, anyone know who W.E. Du Bois is? Yep, I know. Rebecca, so the rest of you, homework, Google W.E.D. Du Bois, and you will look at his first book that he wrote and just kind of skim some of his key things. Brilliant man. Another person that we need to know, aside from the Langston Hughes, the James Baldwin, the W. Du Bois, and we'll add a little bit more for people to look at. All right, so he wrote about the psychological wage, right? That enabled poor whites to feel superior to poor blacks during the civil war, um, rights era, right? Activists talked about white skin privilege, but the concept really came into its own in the late 80s when, Patty, when Peggy McIntosh, a white studies, a woman studies scholar at Wesley, started the Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. How many people know about Peggy McIntosh? You should know because she's been used forever. No? Okay, that's your next homework is Peggy. All right, so you got to, so write down Peggy McIntosh. So you got two people, W.E. Du Bois and you have uh, Peggy McIntosh. And then the other aspect here to go back to what um, Tasia, when what's happening? Why is um, Janelle? I see your hands raised. Question. Janelle, come off mute. Janelle? Previously, she answered in the chat, so possibly she um, 
cat. Oh, what did she answer? Because the way my screen is set, I can't see the chat. So what did Janelle put? She says she knows of Peggy McIntosh. Oh, okay, thank you. She's uh, just acknowledging. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Janelle. Appreciate that. So then that won't be your homework. You'll just have the W.E. Du Bois with everybody else. All right, so you guys got to look about Peggy and the invisible knapsack, right? So we want to make sure that we can go further into that conversation. But when, Tasha, when you're talking about how we need to deal with when people ask you that question just in case they don't want to feel, um, you know, they don't want to get too defensive with them. But what the, the aspect of dealing with white privilege and anti-racist and work now is a thing called white fragility which has been coined by robin d'angelo so this is her book um, it's one of the major books of study that has been undertaken in a lot of the uh, academic uh, institutions of learning this book has been read for the last like now what is it six years or so that it came out it's one of the key pieces to get people to start looking at uh, white fragility because white fragility is the norm in which white people fall back as their defense me mechanism of saying that oh, I take offense to that. I wasn't doing that. And then you have, you know, the white colleague that will cry um, because you may have just said to the points of what we had about, what do you mean? Should I be checking it a steer? What are you talking about that I'm articulating? Oh, I didn't mean that. And then the tears cry and run to her human right, human resources. Like, She's been mean to me. I was only trying to say she was smart. And then you want to turn back and say, okay, I'm smart. Again, the question begs to ask, why would you have a deficit mindset? Right? So you guys have to be prepared to know, to learn, to switch the script real quick because then becomes, you were just saying she was smart. How does that sound? Because again, why do you have a deficit mindset as to where I would be? It would be better if you would just say that I'm in awe of how smart she is. That's better. Right? Because white fragility is a state in which even a minimal amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. The term refers to feelings of discomfort white people experience when they witness discussions around racial inequity and injustice. And it happens a lot. How many people have experienced this? No one's experienced a, a, an episode where, where a white colleague or, 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 or another you know, friend or whichever group in has been like, mm, I didn't mean that, or they're picking on me, or, or they're making these statements, and I don't feel good about it. Go ahead, Rebecca, I see you came off. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I have, especially if you like, like you said, like if you kind of call people out, then they get very like defensive and um, yeah, just get hurt in their feelings. Mm -hmm. And while we're with anti-racism, you guys, you're going to get a lot of people. Tej, I see you came off. You're going to get a lot of people who are going to be like, oh, I don't understand what you're talking about. And I don't want, I don't think you're, why are you making our environment so, so tense? I don't feel good about this. Like this whole Black Lives Matter, every life matter. No, that's a white fragility right there because Every life matters in a society, no matter what. The point is Black Lives Matter is the one in which so much discrimination and racism has, ha has him pampered. So what are you saying to me, right? So we gotta be able to frame. Tasia, you came off? No? Okay, let me jump a little bit because we'll come back. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, let's go into this one for a second, the impact. But okay, some people of color continue to insist that an element of white privilege includes an after effect of conscious choices. For example, if white business leaders don't hire many black um, people of color, white people had more economic opportunities. Having the ability to maintain that power dynamic in itself was a white privilege and it endured. Legislative bodies, corporate leaders and educators are still disproportionately white and often make conscious choices. So laws, hiring practices, discipline procedures that keep the cycle on repeat. The more complicated truth, white privilege is both unconsciously enjoyed and consciously perpetuated. It is both on the surface and deeply embedded into American and Canadian life. It is a weightless knapsack and a weapon. It depends on who is carrying that knapsack. So, you know, people will, again, will say to you, I had to work hard. I came from a single mother too. 
I, um, I also grew up in Jane and Finch. I'm a white kid from Jane and Finch also. So why do you keep thinking that I have all this privilege? No, but you do have a privilege because you still have the ability that even though you live in Jane and Finch, as a white person in Jane and Finch walking down the road, uh, 32 division is not thinking to pull you over and ask you, you know, what's there. If anything, 32 division might pull you over and say, hey, are you okay? Because why are you in this neighborhood, right? And on the flip side, we decide to walk through uh, Rosedale right, Forest Hill, and we're going to get stopped because then they're looking going, why are you in this neighborhood, right? Anything there? We good so far? Yeah, I actually have a question. It may be a little off topic. How come in the news you always see, like, people, like, Black people, and they're usually the ones killing other Black people? Because that is the right, and what you have just bought into though is the media, media stereotypical norms because do white people not kill each other? Okay, yes, it's true, you hear about right? it too. However, the media highlights the black issues, but yet you hear of the black, the white women who have been murdered in their house. Matter of fact, it was just last week, it didn't make the news. There were a black, white woman killed by her husband, didn't make the news. We don't hear about the drug deals of the white people who have been shot up or the bikers who have been shot up and killed. There's several that just happened last month. We don't hear about that. We heard a little bit about the tow truck people who have been killed with the different issues with the tow truck company. So they might spotlight one or two, but it doesn't play out on the same level because the media too is biased in their coverage. It's far more salacious to be able to say, oh, black guys gang related or drug related incident, three dead in a house right three three dead in a house why are they dead but yet we have a we have chinese communities that have uh grow up communities and the the um the gambling situation happening that are shot up on a regular in the markham area and that doesn't make the news do you guys ever see asian people on the news anyone there no barely right so you think that they don't commit crimes Meanwhile, they're, they are hired, they are going to down to police stations, left, right, and center in Peel region because they do a lot of the, 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 um, the um, what do you call it, this, the sex slave um, drive um, industry. They are the one, the major runners of it. Um, the drug running when it comes to grow up and, and heroin and cocaine, they're major uh, uh, people of it. Money laundering, major industry for them. Right, and the list goes on and on, but you never see their, is, their issues played out on the news. So Caitlin, when we're saying to this, that's what we gotta be very mindful. The media likes to portray and put us in a negative light. Why is it always, when you think about a society, why does it seem so much that black people are doing all of this, yet there's no white crime? Yet when you look at police uh, documents, they'll say to you, black, white people are committing far more crimes in, in, in society than black people. However, when we talk about the stops that happen by, by Blacks, if that's the group that's far more surveyed, yes, it's highlight glaringly based on the population. It's, it's way too large. As the human rights point out, 20 times higher, you're going to be stopped or interact with police. Meanwhile, they're overlooking all the other people that are doing other crimes, right? And why is that? Because of the stereotypes and the bias based on our skin colors or what they deem that we will be doing. So yes. just see... Just be very careful of that. And I'm not, and this is not to exclude though, because we really have to have a conversation with our with our black and our indigenous and our own age Southeast Asian communities in particular, especially when we're talking about Guyanese people or anyone of Caribbean descent. We are doing too much foolishness. Our black males in particular, we need a real conversation to stop the shit. And sorry for the, the swearing, but we need to stop it. You are young, you have a lot of abilities, yet why are you guys killing each other over retaliatory issues that have taken place? Because what's happening right now is all a lot of retaliatory crimes. You have killed my brother, my father, my uncle, or whatever. So this person is going out to go kill the next person's father, brother, uncle, or whatever. So they're just back and forth killing off their all different family members because of retaliation. If you all would have just went to the police and said X is the killer, the police would have went and charged those people and we would have been done and we would have had another 35 black males would have still been alive today. But no, everyone's doing vigilante justice and going out there and killing and killing and killing and killing and killing and killing, which will never stop because if I have that mindset in my family that we're just going to retaliate, retaliation is going to keep going until you wipe out a family. 
And we have seen in our Somali community, we have families of males that are all been wiped out in the last three years because of this retaliatory foolishness. And those are the conversations, again, where we're going to do a workshop for Black males, say, stop it. Especially now when we have a government that's saying, okay, they're putting out millions, if not trillions of dollars are now getting put into the Black community to say, all right, we need to hire. Here's programs. Here's startup business money. Here's this. Here's that. Take it. Let's go. Let's get this opportunity because you're brilliant. If you can do an industry of crime, you can do an industry of legit business really well, especially now if you have money, because that means you've got some wheels turning in your head. So let's use it appropriately. Okay, Caitlin? Thank you. No problem. Anybody else? All right, I was going to have you guys do the access and the discomfort, but let's, let's just move for a minute because I want to get us into um, a different piece. We'll come back here. Let's get that flow with the power norms in there. Did you guys get a good understanding of this? And then I'll compress a few things later. Okay, so meritocracy. This is one too where people like to say that they say it to us all the time, our community. If you just work hard, you would have gotten a job. If you would have just worked hard, everything would be perfect for you. Like your community is lazy. Your community doesn't do anything. And that's why you guys don't get jobs. Stop complaining. You know, if you would just go get your degree, if you would just like, you know, fix up yourself, you, you'll go far. Like any job will hire you. I don't get why you guys are complaining. That's a lie. That is so annoying. Oh. Right? And I hear that lie. all the time. It's a lie. Because when we think of it, and we look at all of you online here, I am sure the bulk of you women have at least a degree. And then you may have then your master's. Some of you may have then your MBA. Some may have a PhD. Some have several degrees. So it's not as if it's about you were sitting on your hiney and your duck. No, you went and got educated to the point where you're in debt because you had to and you understand the system is that, yes, we must be educated to compete. And I'm applying for jobs and I'm applying for jobs and yet I'm not getting these jobs or I'm just getting the low entry job while Becky, who has been my classmate before, is just skyrocketing ahead of me and there's no reason for it. I am articulate, I am well-versed, I am presented, but guess what? When you get in and you realize, oh, the next person up, you see only one black woman or a black male that's there and that's all they have. That does you know that, oh, see, they've met their quota. They're not putting any more. Or you look the next one and there might be a Southeast Asian person or a Chinese person and you realize, and you ask that person, so how long have you been in this company? Oh, I've been 20 odd years. And you're the only person at that level? Are you trying to tell me there was no other Indian Chinese black person that has been here for that long that should also be promoted? And that's when the person will look back and really be like, oh, you know, I, I didn't even realize that. Because some people get caught up on their own level. But you got to think, in an institution, for so many years, you only have a handful of five or whatever people of, 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 of different ethnicities in here. You can't tell me that you can find anybody else in all those years that are just as smart, just as abil have able ability to, to succeed, right? So meritocracy to Tim Wise, and I'm going to have to, because none of the hyperlinks are working properly. <clears throat> this video here. Um, bear with me, you guys. Okay, Gavin, what happened to my, um, okay, my tech people, where is my, um, it's not showing me my, my screen so that I can get a new page live. Okay. And does anyone know Tim Wise? Do you guys know Tim Wise? What I'm trying to say to you is if we ever want to really tackle racism 
classism and sexism, we're going to have to interrogate the most fundamental beliefs of our country, the idea of meritocracy, rugged individualism. Right? Are you all because seeing ultimately it? those kinds of beliefs leave us unable no. to be capable of interrogating our world and understanding. Okay. I'm sharing the screen. Can you see him now, a white gentleman? Yep. Okay. So this is Tim Wise, one of the big anti-racist theory guys that I've ever reflect on. This is his little excerpt from when he was talking about meritocracy at one of his lectures that he was given. But so let's listen to how he's framing all of this, okay? What I'm trying to say to you is if we ever want to really tackle racism, classism, and sexism, we're going to have to interrogate the most fundamental beliefs of our country, the idea of meritocracy, rugged individualism, right? Because ultimately, those kinds of beliefs leave us unable, incapable of actually interrogating our world and understanding what's happening currently within it. And let me tell you why that's dangerous, right? See, here's the thing. It's very ironic, right, that that mentality doesn't just hurt people of color. It actually hurts white folks. And this is what I want to conclude with because I want you to get this point. It's the most important point, perhaps. That's why I want to close with it. It's one thing to say that people of color are hurt by the system. That's obvious. And I could give you hours and hours of examples. I've already given you a few. But I want to suggest that not knowing the past, being ignorant about the history and how it brought us to this point is actually dangerous for whites as well. Why? Well, think about it. If you are told that wherever you end up is all about your own effort, at least if you're a person of color, you sort of know that's bullshit, right? Like people of color who know anything about their history know that it's way more complicated than that, right? They know that they've had people in their family that have been working hard for generations, don't have anything to show for it, right? People of color know they did some of the hardest work and continue to do some of the hardest work in this country every day and are not rewarded commensurate with the value that they create and produce. So people of color generally don't buy the myth, but white America has had the luxury of believing it. Even working class white people historically have been able to believe that, well, as long as I work hard, my kids will be better off than me and their kids will be better off than them and their kids will be better off. In other words, white folks have been able to take the idea of mobility for granted, right? At least horizontal mobility, right? So the guy says, well, my granddaddy worked in the mine. My daddy worked in the mine. I'm working in the mine. My kid's going to work in the mine. That's an expectation, isn't it? It's actually a sense of entitlement. By God, as long as we work hard, we'll always have stuff. People of color never had the luxury of believing that. Black and brown folks have never been able to say, as long as I work hard, I'm sure I'll always have employment, right? But white Americans have been able to believe it. Now, why is that dangerous? It's dangerous because what happens if I come to believe that wherever I end up is all about me? And I've had the luxury of buying into that mythology because I'm a member of the dominant group that created the mythology, right? And I think that history flatters me because I wrote it, going back to what Baldwin said. And then all of a sudden, the economy shifts and those jobs disappear, which is what's happening. What if all of a sudden some of those jobs become superfluous and anachronistic? What happens if those assembly line jobs are moving to other countries because it's cheaper to do the work there? What happens if the guy that owns the coal mine discovers that it's cheaper to just blow the top off the mountain with dynamite to get the coal and not have to use as many coal miners? Right. And then all of a sudden the coal jobs are going away because it's cheaper to get the coal in other ways than what you used to do. Now, if I'm a white guy that's always placed an emphasis on my own merit as the determiner of where I end up and I'm struggling suddenly, if I've believed all my life that wherever I end up is all about me and now I'm out of work for 26 weeks, 52 weeks, 99 weeks, as some were during the height of the recession a few years back, what do I do? Because now I'm internalizing shame. Am I not? I'm internalizing blame because there's a voice in the back of my head that says, well, it's all your fault, remember? Because wherever you end up is all about you. So if you're at the bottom, there must be something wrong with you. So what do I do with that shame and that pain? I have to deflect it, don't I? Otherwise, it's going to eat me alive. It's either going to eat me alive or I got to put it on you, right? So now a politician comes along and says, I can take away your pain. Oh, no. The pain that you're feeling, that's not your fault. When those black folks are out of work and when those Latino folks are out of work, that's their fault. That's because they're lazy. When you're out of work, it's also their fault. It's not about you. It's about them. So if you go, oh, good, and then you fall for it, right? But it doesn't really solve your problem to start scapegoating them. You're still dealing with that little voice in the back of your head. And then what happens? Well, think about this story you've all heard about. And I want to suggest this is deeply connected 
to whiteness and white supremacy and the system and history of white privilege. You've heard about the opioid crisis, right? All these white folks in small town America get hooked on heroin. They started off with oxy, right? Because they got a prescription for some pain from a doctor and then they got addicted. Now they're doing street heroin, right? And without all this sympathy, by the way, right? We're talking about, oh, the opioid crisis. We got to help these poor salt of the earth white people who were hooked on dope. My God, we got to help them, right? We got to have rehab and treatment. We didn't do that in the 70s when we had a heroin crisis in black and brown poor communities. We just called people junkies and locked them up. We didn't do that in the 80s with crack. We didn't talk about rehab and treatment. We talked about prison, right? But with these white folks, we got all this sympathy. Well, good. It's about time. We should. But here's the problem. Why do you think the opioid crisis is happening to these folks? In these, there was a, by the way, you may not have heard this. The biggest single correlated factor with support for Donald Trump in the election in a, in a community by community sense was the number of people addicted to opiates in those communities. There was a one-to-one -one linear relationship between the degree of opiate addiction and the support levels for Donald Trump. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that you had to be high to vote for Donald Trump. That's not what I'm saying. That's not my argument, though it's a fascinating hypothesis that some scholars in the room might want to study. That's not my argument. My argument is that what was Donald Trump? He was basically a human opiate, right? He was an opiate in human form. He walks into the room and says, I can take away your pain. Right? By showing you who to who's to blame for. What is an opiate? An opiate is pharmacologically meant to do just one thing, block pain receptors. Right? That's all it does. It blocks pain receptors. And here's a guy that comes along and says, I can block your pain receptivity by blaming these folks and letting you scapegoat them. The problem is opiates and Donald Trump as a human one don't actually solve the problem. Right? If you've got a crushed disc in your back and they put you on opiates to kill the pain, that's not going to fix your back. It's just going to get you through the really bad moments. If you have cancer and they put you on morphine or something to deal with the pain or some opiate to deal with the pain, that doesn't cure your cancer. It just gets you through the worst moments of it, right? The same is true with all the supposed solutions that this president is pushing as a form of political opioid, right? But why are these folks doing it? Think about it for a second. There's a study that came out two years ago from Princeton, and it found a really interesting fact. From 1999 to 2013, there was this huge spike in death rates among one group of Americans only, and that was white, middle-aged, non-college educated working class people. Middle-aged, non-college educated working class whites saw this huge increase in death rates, 200,000 additional deaths compared to what we would have expected, because normally in an industrial economy like ours, the death rates are always going down because you know the place is getting healthier and usually wealthier and unless there's a famine or a natural disaster the rates are normally going in a good direction and they continue to do that for black folks they continue to do that for latinx folks they continue to do that for asian americans they continue to do that for wealthy whites um and and even whites that weren't necessarily wealthy but had a college degree in some sense of you know hope for the future it was just this one group that saw this seemingly inexplicable rise and when that happened there was a really interesting reaction um, there's a conservative columnist for the New York Times who wrote about it and said, so much for white privilege. Look at these white people. They're dying. How can you say white people have privilege and advantage? They're the ones dying. And by the way, they were dying from opioid overdoses, heavy drinking, and suicide. That was the three main contributors to that death spiral, right? So how can you say there's privilege? These folks are killing themselves, right? But actually, I think that was proof of a system of privilege, but a proof of a system of privilege that had finally started to let them down and they didn't know what to do with it. Okay, so what do you think on that piece in the sense, granted Tim is speaking to an American audience, but we get the aspect as when we think about white privilege and the way of meritocracy, how it's always been saying that you need to work hard, you need to work hard. However, it's from their disproportionate perspective and the privilege that they have that they continue to do this because as he clearly noted, Black, brown people have been working hard all their life and they know because they don't have anything to clearly show to say that this aspect of meritocracy really is just a myth because we have done more than anyone else and yet we are still facing the barriers that continue to exist. Thoughts? And I know we're over by a few minutes, but I just want to quickly get your thoughts. Uh, I just want to say that I like completely agree. I think the whole idea of a merit, like the meritocracy is a myth. Um, I think it's just, 
yeah, it's like a really comforting thought. I think especially, especially if you're like the child of immigrants, like my dad and his family like immigrated. So like, if you like that, that's like a very appealing idea that you can work hard and then like succeed, but it's just not true. I think it happens in some cases for some people, but it's not like a, it's not, it's not an actual, like, it's not a fact, like it's not guaranteed. Um, and I think especially, um, like for people of color, like if you're trying to like, I don't know. Yeah. Like he said, like, it doesn't, like, it doesn't actually like match up. Like the work you put in doesn't equate to success, um, in many cases. Others? Yeah, um, this reminds me of a video that I saw in class, in our advocacy class. Our teacher often shows us the opposing opinion, and it made me realize that sometimes using meritocracy as an argument is a like eliminate that admit difference of blame to the individual and themselves, like you said, with the internalizing shame as well. But it definitely shows the hidden structures when you think about how hard you do work and how you're not getting to the same place. But I see it as like an argument for people to not hold themselves accountable to the barriers that do exist. Because then when you eliminate like intersectionality, it's like, well, that's the individual's fault, not who, you know, not the system or anything with regards to why the person's in the position that they're in. Anybody else? So with that, and that's where we're going to leave. So you guys are going to be looking up W.E. Du Bois. You're looking at Peggy McIntosh. Those of you who have never heard Tim Wise, you want to also look at Tim Wise's work. He's, he's actually he's fantastic. The guy just tells it as it is um, and lays it out. And he also talks about his privilege and the way it works, right? But as he has noted, as a white man, he's not supposed to be talking about this, right? He's gotten a lot of death threats and stuff like that because he's speaking out on the issues because he believes it's relevant and it needs to be addressed. Um, and for, for you, in this case scenario, I'm talking about privilege and talking about anti-racism and meritocracy. It's for you to also have a clear understanding, not to internalize certain frameworks to say that, you know, I've done all of this, I'm still not succeeding, what is wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you, right? We have to just know the system to which we work and the institutions within that we work in to find out the ways to navigate. And that's the later on in some of our session is how do we navigate when I talk about being ready for the interview and skills? How do you make sure your resume or for some of you, you might have a CV and you don't realize you have a CV, right? So it's how do we create it, work on it to make sure you're putting your best foot forward, but have an understanding how do you surmount the odds against you to make sure you get in. Some workplaces that we're trying to get into, they're only going to let one or two in. The question is, are you going to be that one or two? And if not, what's the next route that we go for, right? So it's not about having this mindset of saying that something is wrong with you. We live in a larger sister in a structure. The point is, let's get our best foot forward and be prepared to be able to navigate appropriately. So for today's session, I want to say thank you guys. It is great to see some faces here that are, are participating. You guys are fantastic. Um, Next week, Tuesday, though, we have our financial literacy, and then we will come back to this the following week because we have Tuesday is financial literacy, Thursday is our human rights um, presentation to tell you about things to know within the workplace, the general rights component, um, and then we'll come back to dealing with some of this, and then the Thursday is going to be where we start to do the whole public speaking and then interviewing skills as we start to wrap up. Any questions? Yeah, I noticed um, I, I didn't get to take in everything because I was like multitasking, but the recording, will that be available to us as well too? I see that there's a recording button in the right hand. Corner. Yeah, so that's what we're, we're thinking of because there's still intellectual property rights and stuff like that. So um, for you, Tasia, I'm going to figure out what we're going to do because you had previously stated you're going to be coming in late. Um, so let us just speak and then we'll see what we can uh, provide to you. Um, as I noted, though, in the end, I will take some of the slide deck information and provide it to you in like a resource package for later. So at the end of this, I will again create something that you guys will have as referencing point um, and go forward. So we'll let you know. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, also, what I'm going to try to do is so check your email Monday, um, or if I can get it ready by the weekend, we're going to send you a little like tablet um, 
um, that you guys will use to complete your budget. We, I might even do a, a Mary, uh, we call it a Menti or a Padlet in which uh, while we're doing the budgets, people can work together online to input um, because we want to just do the general budgeting and having some other conversations about where you should be looking to put your money because part of this is to also try to, we want to create generational wealth, even if it starts with you in a sense for your next generation that's coming. But so we land with something because right now the housing market is ridiculous. Um, for a lot of you, you won't be able to buy a house unless your parents have 100000 to put down or 150 that they will use from their equity within their own home um, to be able to get you a condo or a house or whichever the case is. A lot of us don't have that. So it's a matter of, okay, where do we start? So at least we make sure our credit starts to get back um, well as a credit score. How do we build that? Uh, because everything is on a credit score. No ifs, ands, or buts people. It's not even about your income. It is that credit score. So how do we make sure that we, we, we rectify and build back our credit score? So um, those of you that don't have a credit card, the issue will be try to get a Capital One then if need be, or go and get a credit card from your bank where you do, uh, what's the one called where you put your own money down? Jesus, my brain. So anyways, one of those cards where we're just going to start to establish where you, you make your payments, make it small. If it's just for your phone bill that you use it for, then that's what it is. That's where you know that you'll never miss that payment. And that way it'll always look like you're a great person with, with rotating credit and we'll work on those things. So uh, look out for that anywhere from Sunday or Monday that something will be coming for you to, to chart to prepare and get ready for uh, our Tuesday session. All right, any questions before I let you go? And I thank you so much for letting us go over seven minutes so far. Uh, uh, Teja, you want to say something? Oh, I just wanted to say thank you <laughs> for the wealth of information. <laughs> I really oh, yeah, appreciate it. You. No problem. Thanks, Rebecca. So I hope to see everybody on Tuesday with your smiley faces. And hopefully, uh, Janelle, you might be able to join us. Um, I know you're trying to multitask at work there. So for everybody, thank you. Great seeing you online. And looking forward to seeing you next week, Tuesday. So have a great weekend. Thank and you. Thank Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Have a nice morning, Bye, morning evening. Hi, everybody. Bye, How everybody. Are we not doing tomorrow? Uh, sorry, what's this? Uh, sorry, so what'd you say, um, Gavin? Are we, are we not doing this tomorrow? Uh, I think uh, she did two hours today, so we'll move in it to two. Oh, well, no. Well, let's stop for a second. Sorry, because you didn't communicate with me. So are we doing Friday? Because that's a piece I didn't get. Did, did everyone oh, yeah. do the Friday? Yeah, so we you suggested to, um, Thursday and Friday instead of Okay, then great. Then, okay, then great, because I didn't get that. I didn't get the yay or nay on that. So who do we lose? We may have lost somebody. So um, we, oh, we'll, we lost we have, people. Then actually, this works perfect. I will continue this tomorrow then, so we can finish the whole aspect of anti-racism oppression. You guys can go look and do the homework, and then let us be able to delve and go even further. All right, because we're going to move on to the aspects of ABR, anti-black racism, the microaggression. So we'll we'll finish that up for tomorrow. Sounds good. Yep, perfect. Sounds good. Okay, thanks, Gavin and you, Uju, for jumping in on that because I, I didn't <laughs> no get problem. All right, love you guys. Uh, we'll see everyone at 10 a.m. tomorrow. All right. Wait, question. Uh, Wait, question. If they're if we're doing it tomorrow, does that mean Tuesday session? Is that still going on or that's still going on because we have we have to just catch up because we lost Tuesday because I was stuck into my annual uh, meeting with Edfo. So that's why I asked for Friday, but we're back on schedule because we what we already have the two presentations that the presenters are coming on. So we're all we're back on track. Okay, cool. I have a question as well. Yeah, either. I'm wondering, um, Earlier when we came in, you said make sure to pick up cer uh, certain equipment or uh, I didn't know yeah, what. So you guys all have a bag. Did I lose Janelle because I can't see everyone? So I hope we have everybody still online. I hope we didn't lose anyone. I think we have lost some. Um, we lost three people. Okay, so we have a bag. So you have a bag that has a book that, that you have some reading assignment attached to it. Um, you have a uh, whiteboard that we use for your vision board. There's some other goodies that are all in this bag for you. Um, so we're just asking if you can try to make your way to the BP, uh, PA to, um, you know, either after we finish our session tomorrow, early next week, so that you can grab your bags. Oh, because uh, I live in Montreal. Pardon me, Beth? I live in Montreal. Can you repeat that? Oh, you're all okay. So we gotta find a way oh. to, to ship yeah. them. Okay, we gotta find yeah. a way to ship that. Too. I'm also out of um, province. I was just where at are you, home. Rebecca? You're where? I'm in I'm in Victoria for school. Oh, hi, you guys. Wow. <laughs>
I'm <laughs> also from Vancouver. Like, Are you so, uh, is it Alliance? It's Alliance. Oh, it's Alliance. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So you're you're out in Vancouver. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So mm-hmm. you gotta find a way to ship these because these are nice little bags you guys can be rocking for. Uh, I'm in Hamilton. <laughs> you're in Hamilton. Not far. I'm not far. I'm not far. I'm in okay. Hamilton, so are so. you coming into Toronto anytime where you can make it? Yeah, there? I could come there. You said tomorrow after um workshop, right? Right, because Uju or Gavin, we can work something out. Can you guys send her an email as to when would be good for her to come by to grab it from you guys? She can come anytime to pick it up. Um, They're always in the office from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So Perfect, perfect. Okay, so fantastic. So, Alliance, we'll work on you, Rebecca, and Yvette. We will find a way to... Alliance. Alliance, thank you, and I love the compliments. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for all the compliments. No My problem. name is Tricky. <laughs> That's all right. Trust me. Mm-hmm. One thing you want to do is always make sure you correct people. Um, oh, yes. Send your, please send your mail and addresses to Uju. Send it into her, and then we will mm-hmm. find a way to ship them to you. And so is that to the BBPA email address? Yes. Okay. Is that the right gotcha. one with you that we want? Yes. Office at BBPA.org. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank Fantastic. you. All right. See you guys tomorrow. So do your reading, and let's come strong for tomorrow's discussion. Awesome. Have a nice one. You too. Have a good one. Nice day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. So we're we're just the last three here, right? Yes. Okay. Um. So okay. So tomorrow, same time, we'll be on. Um. And then. For the person for Tuesday, for um, so what I'll try to do Monday, flip you whatever the tablet or the mentee, or I guess it'll just be have to be built, it'll be built into my slide. Um, and that person, I guess, will try to work off of that as everyone's trying to develop their um, their budget. So that way, we kind of have a live shot where people can plug things in or can see. So we'll, we'll see how it works, it might be a little bit tricky, but we'll see what we can do with it.